Thank you for listening to the ECMWF Copernicus Climate and Atmosphere Spaces podcast. In this edition, we spoke to some fantastic experts about wildfires. However, during the original live recording, we experienced some technical difficulties. As a result, some sections of this episode were recorded at a later date and edited back into their original placement within the episode, which you may pick up on while listening. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Twitter Spaces episode powered by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, also known as ECMWF. My name is Simus Malis, and I will be your moderator. Today's episode is dedicated to a phenomenon that has been receiving a lot of media attention in the past decade because of its intensity and frequency. I'm referring, of course, to wildfires. According to the European Commission, in 2022, uh, we observed nearly 17,000 fires in 45 countries with the total burnt area exceeding uh, the 1.6 million hectares. To understand the magnitude of such a disaster, we're talking about the size of a country like Montenegro. Already on, the European Union has been ramping up its activities to combat wildfires by doubling its firefighting fleet this year to count 28 aircraft stationed across 10 countries. But today we will be talking about how we can use uh, data and services from the European Union Space Program and more specifically Copernicus to observe, forecast and provide some support in the management of wildfires. For that, I am joined by a unique bunch of experts, uh, Dr. Isabel Trigo, senior researcher at the Portuguese Institute for Sea and Atmosphere and uh, senior researchers at the European Center for Medium Range uh, Weather Forecasts, also known as uh, ECMWF, Dr. Uh, Francesca Di Giuseppe and Dr. Mark Parrington. Welcome, everyone. Now, before we dive into the details about how Copernicus, and more specifically, the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service uh, contributes, let's take a closer look Uh, at wildfires. And uh, I believe there is no better person for that other than uh, Dr. Trigo. So Dr. Trigo, my first question for you would be, what do we define uh, as wildfires and how do they impact uh, our planet? Wildfires normally refer to fires in forests or rural areas, burning any type of natural vegetation or crops. We may also refer to these as landscape fires. These are highly disruptive events affecting entire ecosystems, plants and animals, and the regeneration of burnt areas may happen at very different paces over different regions. Forests may take decades or even longer timescales to regrow, and many burnt areas may suffer profound changes and even evolve towards completely new land covers or land use. Wildfires affect air quality through smoke emissions, and they also have very high social economic impacts. Let's think of all the effort and costs that are associated to the organization of the means to control these events. The effort of firefighters and civil protection authorities to suppress uh, wildfires, And often this event will not be enough to prevent severe damage to properties, infrastructures, people's houses, and even people's lives may be at risk and unfortunately sometimes lost. Thank you for shining a light on that. Uh, Indeed, very insightful. Is there a way to measure today wildfires and their impact? What what kind of information do we have available uh, today? We can use satellite observations to identify and to measure wildfires. We can identify hotspots using observations from instruments currently flying on several satellites, including polar orbiting platforms such as Sentinel-3 or geostationary satellites such as the European Meteosat series or the North American GO series. Observations from various channels, but especially measurements in what we call the middle infrared. This is bands that are close to fire's maximum radiative emission, allow us to identify these hotspots of fires burning 
at subpixel scale and also to est estimate their radiative power, which is a measurement of the intensity of each event, which is closely related to combustion rate and therefore to the rate of emissions of combustion gases and particles, or smoke. Polar orbiting satellites such as Sentinel-3, flying at lower orbits, have better spatial sampling than geostationary observations, while these have much better temporal sampling. Right. So, I could not help but wonder, is this information available in real time? And if so, how often are we fed with this kind of data? The information from satellite data, this is the identification of hotspots and the characterization of their intensity, is available in near real time. That means the latency is low, but it is still of the order of one hour. The, this is the time between an observation is actually made, so a satellite observation is made, and a satellite product is available to users. From my own experience at the Portuguese Meteorological Service, IPMA, I know that this data, this is especially the high-frequency information on wildfires from satellite, uh, geostationary satellite data, is very useful um, as a tool to provide a synoptic or global view of all fires occurring at a given time and to follow their evolution. Okay, that, that, that's fascinating. Uh, I was wondering, so observing is one part of the uh, equation, uh, but what about uh, forecasting the, the risk of wildfires? What, what can be done today? So... Uh, yes, of course, wildfire happens where there is enough fuel that has undergone a curing process. So, for example, it has dried due to long-term drought condition. And then when ignition takes place, fire spread is mostly controlled by wind and the morphology of the land scale. So fire will spread more easily on steep surface, for example, where fuel is uninterrupted. So you can say that the fire occurrence is most controlled by weather. So when we talk about the fire forecast, if we're forecasting fire, what we are talking usually is about forecasting landscape flammability. And there are several metrics that can be used to this uh, scope. One of the most used uh, metrics is called fire weather index. These models usually tell us how likely is fire to develop and sustain itself once ignited. So it's crucial to understand that we usually do not forecast where an ignition is taking place, but only how this fire once ignited are likely to sustain and spread. Uh, and uh, still these metrics are very useful because uh, they can uh, be used to identify potential area at risk where there might be requirements for suppression action if, uh, as we say, an ignition is taking place. Essentially, fire forecasts build on our capability to accurately forecasting the weather. So system use for fire management can provide advance warning up to 10 days based on weather changing patterns. But the community is also looking at extending this uh, possibility to forecast uh, and try to forecast uh, at the seasonal uh, time scale. So for example, this, uh, uh, this rec recent um, development uh, are proven to be quite useful. So uh, to, to see uh, if we look at the recent event in uh, Alberta, Canada, for example, the, there are um, studies that show that uh, we could have predicted the unprecedented weather condition almost two months uh, ahead. And there are also new direction in fire forecasting. It's trying to incorporate a way to predict emission that are not uh, included at the moment, for example, from lightning in remote area, but also due to human behavior. And in this respect, uh, data-driven models using, for example, machine learning would be very useful. 
we can say that in the last year they improved the accuracy of weather prediction and also more recently the advance of machine learning opened new perspective for fire danger forecast to extend the predict the prediction of fires. And this I believe these are very exciting time for uh, the fire forecasting community. Wow, machine learning. I can see that uh, artificial intelligence is, is really becoming a trend uh, in Earth observation. Um, uh, well, my last question uh, to you would be, do you see any relation between the intensity and the frequency of wildfires and, and climate change? It's, it's kind, of, kind of controversial, but what, what do you think about it? So it's very important to understand how uh, fire occurrences change in the last decades. There are several scientific studies that have highlighted how complex it is actually to understand this link. It's not uh, trivial. Uh, indeed, uh, as this might surprise many people, there have, uh, we have witnessed a substantial global reduction of burned area globally. And uh, crucially, fires have become much more intense, so that they, they are often named the megafire. And these fires uh, we have seen are incontrollable so much so even uh, the most sophisticated area suppression technique uh, are not useful and they are left to burn until rain comes. Fires are also now occurring, and this is, uh, has been seen in the record, in less fire-prone areas as, such as the Boreal region. I don't know if you remember a few years ago in both in Alaska and uh, um, in Siberia, there were many ongoing fires for a, a stretch of times. And this is our, our of great concern because of course they can release vast amount of trapped carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, the Copernicus Emergency Management Service, also in collaboration with CMWF, has released a very useful data set for whoever is interested. A look at changes in landscape flammability uh, from 90, dating back 1940 to present day. And this is, I think, a very good resource because it allows uh, to monitor the current state of wildfire globally and to identify changes uh, to, to all these parameters. Um, also, a detailed analysis can, is usually available through the, um, to a publication that is released every year by the Copernic Climate Change Service, the European State of the Climate. And it's a good way to, to keep yourself uh, um, up to date with the, the recent change of uh, fires, uh, mostly focused in Europe, but also in other important regions like the Borel region. And could be a, a good um, way, if anybody is interested, to follow up uh, on these uh, topics after this event. Thank you, Dr. Di Giuseppe. That was indeed very enlightening. So for those who would like to learn more, you can always check out the European State of the Climate Report, uh, which is available on the Copernicus Climate Service website. Now, talking about Earth observation, let's talk more about Copernicus. I'll, I'll give the floor to Dr. Mark Parrington here. Dr. Parrington, in simple terms, how does the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service monitor the wildfire emissions? I mean, how can we monitor wildfires uh, from space, essentially? So, yeah, so, so thanks to Francesca for this excellent introduction and background. She, she already touched on some of the types of observations that we're using in the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service to, to monitor the actual emissions from fires. And um, one of these is the direct observations of fires themselves. So um, as Francesca said, there's satellites that are in orbit um, measuring all the time and they're through their measurements when there are active fires, um, there's an almost instantaneous observation of this parameter of fire radiative power. Um, and there's been scientific research in the past that shows there's a very strong, almost linear relationship between fire radiative power and then the, um, the actual amount of vegetation and fuel that is consumed by the fire. And by, by knowing this relationship and you basing our um, estimates on other research that looks at the quantities of gases and aerosols and particulate matter emitted by burning vegetation, we're able to 
provide an estimate of global fire emissions in near real time. And this is crucial to what we're doing in CAMS, in which we're essentially running a weather forecast, but for atmospheric pollution. And when there are big fires, all that smoke pollution is, is a big driver of, of atmospheric pollution. And so we need that real ne near real time information to be able to have accurate forecasts. Um, and then on, on top of the actual observations of fires themselves, we're feeding that information into our, into our forecast system. But we also have the observations of the atmosphere. So we have observations of aerosol optical depth, which is the amount of particular matter in throughout the column of the atmosphere, carbon monoxide, so, which is an excellent tracer for uh, fossil fuel combust combustion as well as biomass combustion. Um, it comes about from the, the carbon not being fully consumed by the fire. And it is an excellent tracer because it has a, an atmospheric lifetime of about 30 to 40 days. And so then you can really track where a smoke plume goes to. Um, and I'll come back to this uh, like, like we've been doing, doing recently, but what a lot of the monitoring that we do in CAMS is also based on. Right, right. I believe now what, what our audience would like to also uh, hear more about is how can we actually use the Copernicus atmosphere monitoring data? What, what, what could be some concrete use cases? Who's the actual, who's the end user uh, of this data? Okay, well, in the first instance, so we're providing this forecast. There's a number of uh, very well-known uh, web and mobile phone applications which are showing our forecast. So a five-day forecast that's updated twice a day, every day. Um, to provide the, the latest information on air quality at the global scale and, and as well as the local scales. And so these applications can be used by anybody to see what the air quality li is like in their location and how that might change, particularly when there's fires and if they're downwind from the, the smoke transport. Um, but then there's, there's other applications. So looking at, uh, say, on the policy support, um, I've been involved in a lot of conversations with wildland fire ma managers, wildland fire fighters who are using more and more earth observation data, not just for the fires themselves, but the atmospheric and air quality impacts. Um, and then things like solar energy production, they want to know when um, the, the amount of sunlight reaching the solar panels might be reduced due to desert dust, but also to, to wildfire smoke. Yeah, I believe that uh, policy and decision makers would find a lot of interesting information there. Is there a platform where they could access this kind of data, like, for example, uh, the climate data story? Uh, yes, of course. Well, I think in, gen in general for Copernicus data, from the, the satellite observations to the, the service level data, which is what we provide in CAMS, as well as the Emergency Management Service and the, the Climate Change Service, is that all of this data is open ac fully open access and available for anybody that wants to, to use it. So you mentioned the climate data store. This is generally the, the Copernicus Climate Change Service data. We have an equivalent atmosphere data store, which is all, all of the, our forecast products and analysis and reanalysis products available from one location. And in the near future, these two data stores will be combined in, into one single uh, point of access for being able to access the, the different data sets. Now, Dr. Parrington, do you have any insights you'd like to share with us? What's next in terms of CAMS? Okay, well, there's a lot of things, of course, but particularly in the context of wildfires is, um, as I mentioned, we're basing our fire emission estimation on satellite observations. We're, we're running a system which we've been running for quite a long time now based on two uh, particular satellite instruments which uh, have been going for the last 20 years. But we're looking to continually improve on that to incorporate uh, newly available observations of fire rate power from, from different satellites and also moving towards geostationary and uh, which would give us this um, diurnal uh, measurements to capture the full, um, the full daily changes in fire activity around the world. Um, there's some limitations in, in what we've been using so far in which you only get one, more or less one observation over a particular location per day. But we're getting, we're seeing satellite instruments with ever increasing coverage and resolution, and being able to optimize and make use of those observations in estimating fire emissions and um, air quality forecasting uh, will really improve and um, make our um, uh, data sets more usable. Exciting times ahead for the Copernicus program. Some time left for a short Q&A. I've already seen some questions here on the chat. If there are more, we'll be, we'll be able to accommodate a few. 
I see here there is a there is one. So the question is, what is the role of Copernicus uh, Sentinel two and Sentinel three in wildfires monitoring? Yes, so Sentinel two and Sentinel three are uh, two of the uh, main platform from the Copernicus uh, service. And uh, they are both equipped uh, with uh, channels that allow to uh, understand uh, uh, fire activities on the planet. In particular, Sentinel-2 has a very high resolution of few uh, tens of meters and uh, allow a really uh, detailed detection of fire activities uh, uh, most of the beautiful image that you see on the on the web, uh, I mean, beautiful and dramatic uh, uh, images that you can uh, see are actually from these sensors. And the more recently also Sentinel-3 has been delivering uh, fire radiative power from many satellites. And this is, this really complements what was uh, already available uh, from the, um, U.S. NASA platform uh, carrying uh, VIRS and MODIS data. I think we are in a very special moment uh, for uh, the detection of fire activity uh, worldwide because never as uh, before we had such a, a comprehensive uh, possibility to monitor uh, fire activity on the planet. So we should really try our best to to exploit all the available information from the Copernicus program. Now, I see here another question on the chat. Um, so what can we expect from UMETSAT's Meteo 3 generation satellite, which is currently in operation? Uh, I mean, we saw some really breathtaking pictures uh, making the news a few weeks ago. Just to reflect also on what, what Francesca talked about in the answer to the previous question, I think it's we, we're talking very specifically about uh, measuring the characteristics of the fire, but there's actually a lot of very valuable and very um, high resolution visible imagery available from these um, these satellites. So we, we may not use that, that kind of imagery and data directly in, in our services, but there's people like Pierre Marcuse on Twitter who shows very nicely how to use these kind of satellite imagery to look at landscape fires around the world at high resolution um, and there's also a lot of tools that have been developed by, by him and others which are all publicly available so that pe any user can take those those imagery and, and see for themselves what it looks like. Um, in terms of the, the UMETSA MTG um, I uh, geostationary satellite was launched uh, a few weeks ago um, this has the potential to really increase the not just the spatial resolution, but the time resolution in which we observe fire. So um, I alluded before, there's this, a lot of the satellites we use are in this so-called low Earth polar orbiting um, uh, configuration, which means they're, they're crossing the equator at the same local time every day. So they're only getting one observation in a location per day. Um, but with geostationary, it stays in the same location and it's measuring with five, 10, 15 minute time resolution to, to, throughout the whole day. Um, and the first uh, images we've seen from, from MTG is really high resolution where you can almost observe uh, fire front propagation, particularly in tropical regions of Africa where there's a, a lot of fire. Um, and so that plus a constellation um, of geostationary satellites around the world combined with this low earth orbiting information really gives us a chance to have much better spatial and temporal representation of fire emissions and activity. Um, and this is what we're moving towards within, within CAMS and our uh, fire emission estimation system is to what utilizes much of the observational information as possible. Thank you, Dr. Parrington. As I'm afraid we're running out of time, we cannot take more questions. I'd like to thank our special guests, Dr. Di Giuseppe and Dr. Parrington, for being with us today and for shining a light on this uh, rather hot topic. And I would like to remind our audience that more episodes are coming, so stay tuned and make sure to follow the Copernicus ECMWF account. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>